have the next panel come up. Going to be talking about uh, the legal developments in crypto payments. And just as somebody who works in media strategy for a couple of companies that are looking at crypto, this is definitely uh, something we get a lot of inquiries from reporters about because there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty, as you know, uh, around crypto, uh, crypto payments and crypto in general. So I'll leave it up to the panel to, uh, to discuss that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, good morning. Thanks for showing up early to hear about the what I think is actually a, a pretty interesting topic. I'm gonna skip introductions because they're all up there. You can read about it. I'll tell you, we've got a group of lawyers and accountants up here. So raise your hand if you want to commit some crimes. <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, but I, I'll start out. We seem to be in what everyone's saying, we're in the crypto winter, I've heard a crypto ice age. Why, why should anybody care about crypto? The market's tanking. Well, I'll say why should anybody care about crypto as an investment vehicle? The market's tanking. Almost anybody who's put money in except for three years ago has lost their money and is an idiot <laughs> for doing so. Uh, why should we talk? Why should we even be thinking about crypto as an investment vehicle? Don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> you're, yes. you're not an idiot. <laughs> uh, well, I'll take that. Um, you know, cryptocurrency has a, a lot of use cases, uh, whether it's stable coins, utility coins, uh, raising capital, charitable projects. But one of its original purposes, and, and I still think one of the most exciting, the most promising, is crypto as a payment method. And we are still very much at the forefront of cryptocurrency being used as a payment method. There have been some case studies. Um, there have been some organizations that are using it as a payment method, but it's still, still very early. So whether you're an investor um, or an adopter of the technology, this is still a, a great time to sort of wade into that territory. Excellent. Ed, do you, you have anything to add of, you know, I think there's mostly payment companies here, is why should payment companies be concerned with what's happening in crypto? Well, there's still a trillion reasons why, uh, even though the market is tanked, it's still a lot of currency out there uh, that people have. And, and I, mean, I, I, by training, I'm a payments lawyer. Crypto was something I got drug into, unwillingly kicking and screaming. I didn't want to learn about it, and I had to, because uh, my clients were interested in it. And I think the answer is, you know, if, if if you're not focused on crypto uh, and that big market that exists, your competitors are. So if, if you're a payment processor and you don't support or have a, a partner that can support crypto transactions, you're at risk because the guy down the street will offer an omni-channel product that does, we do credit cards, ACH and crypto. Uh, and if your merchants want to accept it, you can't provide that solution and you're, you're putting those relationships at risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Like Ed, I am also, a payments attorney. We actually happen to be on the other end of two cases right now, so we put Lou between us in case a fight breaks out. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I personally care about crypto. I've been a payments attorney for about 13 years, and I see this as what will be the biggest shift in our industry. When I got into the industry, it was still, you know, the knuckle buster running across the table, and now. People are paying on their phones, people are paying on a POS, and you know, most everybody has some kind of payment method linked to their phone, but every single person that has crypto is holding a little bit on their phone or can access it through their phone. So I hear what you're saying there, Ed. Um, where do things stand right now with crypto? What are the issues out there that people need to know before dealing with crypto. Michael, you got something on that? Yeah, I mean, the biggest issue that you see right now is in the courts and whether or not cryptocurrencies, tokens, et cetera, are securities versus commodities versus currencies, or are they some of all of those categories? And the answer that I've been seeing coming down in the case law is that they fall into all of those different categories depending on the 
unique factual circumstances. Um, and this right now is all, like I said, being kicked around by courts because legislatures are, for lack of a better phrase, dragging their feet on regulation in the space. Um, so existing legal frameworks are providing the backdrop for how cryptocurrencies are being classified and what regulations, if any, do apply. Um, the misconception out there, I think, is that there is no regulation. I don't see that as accurate. Um, it's what regulations do apply. Um, most recently, the trend is toward classifying cryptocurrencies as securities. Um, it's the Howey test, United States Supreme Court. Um, it's a very broad, factually driven test, but anything that you are perceived as an investor, essentially any time you're giving a company your money and relying on the common enterprise of them using your money to make you more money, you're probably falling into the security realm. And so that's what we get a lot of in our practice are, um, companies wanting to do initial coin offerings and wanting to avoid increased regulation, not wanting to be qualified as a security. So one of the creative ways I see companies trying to get around that right now is gaming. I mean, cryptocurrency and gaming is an emerging area where you can potentially operate outside the realm of securities and investment. Um, if things are being awarded as a prize. Um, but yeah, big picture, I mean, that's what I see. That's what's happening right now. That's where most of the litigation um, is taking place. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard one theory that I kind of liked, kind of, I could get my teeth into. It wasn't that Joe Biden is a robot, even though that one's kind of starting to make sense. But um, <laughs> the... Uh, the theory I heard is that the, the Fed is purposely not regulating the industry so that it collapses upon itself. And it seems to be working. I mean, when you have Bitcoin down, what, 300% and, you know, all of the coins tanking, indexes, you know, the whole exchange going bankrupt and people losing their money, it, it seems to go this is working. I mean, there's a fear index out there of like, what's the fear? And I think it's been in the red for the last three months. So, you know, as I re religiously check my wallet, you know, I'm terrified every time I open it. So I'm certainly not putting any more money in right now, except for then there's a little bump and you're like, I'm going all in, and then it drops again. Anyways, but um, <laughs> it seems to be working with that regulation, you know, we're just not going to touch it and we'll let the criminals all take over. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, it's almost like the, the fear of impending regulation is driving that fear index. Um, but you're right, it's almost like they're, they're just dangling that fear of regulation um, in order to scare investors away, which then causes problems for the exchanges. And the, like you said, then the exchanges themselves are, are kind of imploding. Uh, we've seen it with Voyager going under. There's been rumors of Coinbase going bankrupt. They had massive layoffs. Um, but I think this is still part of the, the, the normal growth cycle of a very, very new technology. This isn't a, a death spiral at the end of this technology. I mean, we're at the very, very forefront of it. Um, and at, at best, what it's going to do is, is force these exchanges um, to get tighter and smarter about how they operate. And we're gonna come out of this and crypto will become uh, a major player in the payment processing industry. But it is, I mean, I don't think there's any bones about it that it is a Ponzi scheme. It only works if people are putting their money in, Currently, right? Currently, yes. <laughs> so how do you regulate that? I mean, in the payments industry, you know, you all did great with no regulation. And then regulation came, and you also did pretty well, too. Um, so, so how do we, I mean, where's the line here of we're all scared of regulation coming, but won't regulation help? 
Yeah, I mean, we have to remember that cryptocurrency, when it has been used as a payment method, it's still being used for monetary purposes. And, and when it is, it does still fall under some regulation. I mean, we've seen it with the clients that we've worked with. They'll say, we want to use cryptocurrency for this in our project. And, and we say, well, then, then you're now still following under money transmitter laws or, or different areas of regulation that apply to fiat. Um, so to say that crypto is completely unregulated is not true uh, because when it is used as a monetary device, there, there are still those regulations and they are helping. Yeah, I mean, Ed, where are you seeing the line here? So I, I guess part of my thought is, is when regulation comes, you see how much of the value is derived for it being used for illicit purposes. Right. If you were going to start applying AML regulations and, and, and you know, uh, anti-money laundering um, regulations to, to crypto, and all of a sudden it loses a lot of value, well, that tells you that a lot of its previous uses were illicit. Um, but the fact that it hasn't, it hasn't gone to zero, um, if you look at like the his historical stock market, you know, when the stock market was new, you had these amazing runs and busts. Um, and so I, I think what we're seeing, what we'll see is, is some, some currencies emerge um, from the, the, the ice age, the, the winter of, of crypto, uh, and those will probably, you know, be more regulated, have more of a following, and, and people will recognize the value. I think um, what's, but regulation is needed, and I have a, a kind of a funny story about um, the current state of the law and crypto. So we were trying to help a client recently, or maybe a couple of years ago, figure out a digital wallet. And it was going to hold crypto, but it really was going to hold the value of the crypto because they didn't want to be in, involved in actually moving the crypto around because they didn't want to get you know, the New York digital license to do it. Um, and, and we started looking at, you know, let's, let's look at the securities landscape. And that was confusing because you had the Howey test and you had you know, different people, different regulators taking different views on it. And some even saying like, well, certain cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin isn't a security, but other ones over here are. Uh, and that's confounding because they all operate basically the same. Um, you had people saying what's a commodity, but you have to figure out how to affect actual delivery of it uh, to avoid being uh, a broker, a, a commodities broker, if you're holding the, the currency. But what ended up being the most persnickety rule we had to work around was a bucket shop law. And these were laws that came out of the 1910s uh, when it was hard to trade stocks on the stock exchanges. And so people would go to bars in like, you know, far flung counties and there would literally be buckets on the wall and they would have stock ticker symbols on it. And you'd put your money in and at the end of the day, they would you know, get the readout from the stock market and you would hand out cash based on whose stock did better. That is actually, but, but it was, it was the, the, the law applied to the digital wallet holding crypto 110 years later because you were, you were trading on the value of it, but not actually holding the currency itself. Uh, and so that has been, you know, a consistent, a consistent problem is we have not only uncertain federal law, but you have all these state laws that could potentially apply. Uh, and we need to get some regime that works to make, to make acceptance um, more kosher. Um, but I do think with regulation will come legitimacy and with legitimacy more sustainability in the market. Where do you think we, where do you think the regulation goes best? Is it protecting, you know, the uneducated investor from putting all his money into the coins that you're not talking about? Um, that will do well? Is it money transmitter laws? You know, is it regulating the exchanges? I know, you know, at our firm, we're getting calls, hey, I lost all of my money. Mm -hmm. what, what do I do? Do those people need protection or, you know, are they, you, know, you should have read the fine print. You knew this was a gamble. Don't invest money you can't lose. Where do you think the regulation serves the industry the best to make this a viable, form of payment because the other the other panels here I think everyone can agree this technology is legit this technology mm -hmm. will help society as a whole transact payments faster have new cool te technologies you know if nothing just to make life a little easier yeah which would be great so wh where does the regulation need to go where should we be kind of pushing it because I know in the payment space 
you know, in the beginning, I'm like, this is great. There's no regulation. It's the Wild West. Our clients are constantly stealing from each other. And they got me on speed dial. And they also <laughs> crashed their Ferrari. <laughs> so where, where does it, but, you know, then regulation came. And it's, you know, it's even better, you know. Yeah. So where, uh, where can we point this in crypto? Where should we be advocating it? So if you want to, I, my, if, if I ruled the world, yeah. James, which you know I don't. I wish uh, you did. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I think if you want, if you want to support the value of it, I think, I think treating it like a security is probably a good thing. I mean, you, you deal with, you know, disclosures, unsophisticated investors, you stop people from doing things that, you know, insider trading type activity that would be totally unlawful in a normal securities market that was happening all the time with crypto. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, so much of the value does derive from being able to use crypto in places where you can't use fiat currency or, or more traditional payment methods. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, having some guardrails around illicit activity, um, you know, that, that needs to happen as well. I think that will depress the value somewhat um, if, if you know regulators are making sure you can't use, you know, crypto to buy narcotics uh, or something like that. Um, but I think those are probably the two areas that most need to have regulation. But I, I really think the securities is the one that is impacting most ordinary people day to day uh, who are putting you know, their college savings or their retirement funds in crypto, just hoping that the, the train, you know, the roller coaster went up forever um, without having some of the same protections that securities investors would have. Yeah. I mean, Michael, you're, you're actually talking to these people that are, have lost their money at, you know, deep. Do you agree or disagree or have thoughts on that? The regulations that are coming are geared towards investor protection. I mean, the House right now has the Digital Assets Market Structure and Investor Protection Act. So, yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, Is but, there an acronym? <laughs> uh, you know, I thought the same thing and I, I refrained from making one up <laughs> okay. myself. Okay. Because I didn't know what it would spell. Um, <laughs> probably something different. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, and the key for me there is Investor Protection Act, and that's the whole thing with respect to want the governments, the states, the Fed. They want to classify cryptocurrencies as securities because that provides the avenue for the most investor protection. Um, that's what I've noticed as I've scoured through the different regulations and laws that are on that are being proposed in various jurisdictions um, one of the key things you've seen these big crypto investment firms Voyager Celsius and you mentioned coinbase might be teetering on the brink there um, file for bankruptcy protection and so, like James was mentioning, the people that I'm talking to that are out there on the, in the chat rooms and putting together funds to pursue these companies to try and get their money back because they lost all of it, one of the key things that's happening there that I've noticed is these, these crypto companies, they go file for bankruptcy just to wipe their hands of the whole situation. But if those companies are not registered as brokerages, investor assets are not protected. So a traditional brokerage goes bankrupt, there is protection of investor assets in the bankruptcy proceeding. If these companies are operating under the impression that, hey, we're not, these aren't securities, we're not a brokerage, we're filing for bankruptcy, then the situation that's developing there is all these investor assets are up for grabs from all the creditors. So that's a scary thing for those who invested and lost all their money. But that's also a way around the stay that gets placed on litigation from a bankruptcy, because investors can say, I'm not getting adequate protection through this bankruptcy proceeding. Um, it's, that's a developing area and something that I've been looking at with respect to trying to help some of these investors get their money back via the existing legal framework. 
but to answer the question in uh, less of a uh, and with less words would be to say that the regulation that's coming is all investor protection. Um, that's what I'm seeing, at least as I look through the various jurisdictions. Yeah, I mean, that seems like the easy one is consumer protection, but there's a cost to that. Lou, I know that you deal a lot with companies that are trying to raise money by offering a coin or just putting it on the exchange. And we'll do these calls with this company and they're like, how do I do this? You know, if I go the full route and I register this as a security or I do everything to make it look like that and I jump through all those disclosures, you know, I hear us saying a lot of time, you're not going to make it to, you know, take a company public or do a public offering. I mean, there's a reason that not everyone doesn't do that. What's the cost? You know, I don't know if there's a, a good answer to this or I'm just talking myself here, answering my own question, but there is a cost of, you know, for a while doing an ICO was a really easy way to raise a bunch of money for, you know, we've got a guy, and, and I like this idea, he's tokenizing tire rims. So if you've got one tire rim ruined, you know, you make an NFT of it and then you can put it on the network and you can find your one tire rim instead of buying four. and. You know, he, he loves his tire companies. He's been working in wheels his whole life, but he doesn't have, you know, $400,000 to take his pump company public. You know, five years ago, he could have done an ICO and put this thing on the exchange and potentially raised, you know, $4 million in a week and a half. So where's the line here? Because there was a huge benefit of being able to go public to raise money for people like, sure, I'll put 10 bucks in that and things like that. So what, is there a line there or is there, can those two things coexist? Yeah, what's, what's difficult is that, you know, these things get kind of industry specific. So we, and we've talked to a lot of different clients in a lot of different industries. That's a pretty unique one. Um, and the first thing we do on a lot of these calls with these people is try to find out what the use is for that coin that they're trying to launch. And if, if it starts to border on a security, then we start having more in-depth conversations about what regulations would apply, what type of work that involves to make sure you're in compliance with those. Um, we don't try to skirt them away from that, but we, we definitely suggest other options that make that token more of a utility token rather than a security. Um, so that way it doesn't end up being that half a million dollar investment to try to launch this coin just to raise $100,000 in capital and you end up losing money on the deal. Um, so that's why we always say it's so important to engage a professional firm that, that knows those intricacies about the different industries, the different regulations, and help you guide the right decision of how you're going to launch. So you're saying even if these regulations drop and, you know, there's a bunch of hoops you have to jump through, there'll still be a way to raise money with the coins? Well, de depending on how you know, extensive these regulations get, it's going to get harder and harder. Um, but there are still certainly always going to be cryptocurrency uses that don't fall under a securities designation um, and regulation. Um, there's still always utility tokens and, and stable coins and things like that that aren't going to be heavily regulated like a monetary um, fiat type coin. Mm -hmm. I see one, I mean, crypto seems great. I think there's great technology, but I personally, when I look at it, and we were talking about this outside a little bit of, I think the, the huge benefit of, or the, the biggest opportunity in the legal field and you know, in a use case is actually the NFTs. And I'm not talking about, you know, the picture of the monkey that's worth, you know, $3 million. I'm talking about the actual ownership. And I've heard people say, you know, the, the title insurance industry is wiped out with NFTs. You know, anyone who's bought a house recently or refied, and that's probably like 80% of the people here in the last couple of years, is it was a nightmare. Why am I signing all of these contracts in the NFT age? Scan, click, you've got it all there. You can see this person did an addition, this person did that. And then I started thinking, I was like, well, what about the DMV? 
I think we could get rid of the DMV with NFTs Amen. too. <laughs> and I think most people would agree with that, but then there's all these implications of what does that do if you're not having necessarily you know, a state-run organization making sure we're all, you know, have our right hair color. Some of our hair color changes over time though, but um, what are you guys' thoughts on that, on the values of NFT or the legal implications there? I, I think once again, and I'll let these guys jump into, um, similar to cryptocurrency being used as a payment method, we are at the very, very infancy of NFTs and have yet to really discover their potential. Um, but they are, they are going to be, they're more than just copywriting artwork. There's so many more uses for NFTs in the smart uh, contract world that uh, it's going to really revolutionize the way those are used um, and very beneficially. So like the NFT, I mean, if, I'm, if I want to get in and then invest in NFTs, the way you do that right now, though, is like buying Ethereum, right? or places where NFTs are written or minted, is that true? Like where do I, where do I get in on the NFT boom? Well, so I, I think it's, at this point, it's tough to look at NFTs as an investment opportunity. That's how a lot of people thought they were going to be in the art world. But I think when they're used in the smart contract world, um, it's not so much an investment opportunity as it is um, just a benefit to the way those things operate. So I, I wouldn't look at NFTs in that segment as a way to make money. It's just a way to make all of our lives easier and more secure. Fair enough. Got about five minutes left on the great countdown clock up here. Um, I'll open it up for questions. Otherwise, you know, we're paid to talk, so we'll we just talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about over here? I mean, what I think, starting with NFTs, what I think is cool about NFTs is, and we were talking about abolishing the DMV, which woke everyone up, I'm sure, <laughs> but the record of ownership and the lack of ability to get past that, smart contracts, recording things on the blockchain, um, regardless of whether the investment value is going down or not, I think that NFTs are a cool way of establishing ownership in the digital world that we're operating in right now. There's not going to be as many arguments about contracts and agreements and fraud and the inducement and, th well, there's not going to be as much fraud. You're not going to be able to get around it. You're not going to be able to say, that wasn't me. I didn't agree to that. It's all going to be recorded automatically, blockchain, ledger. That's the real value in practicality, I think, regardless of what the investment value is associated with these things. And someone yesterday, my son was really excited about this, but someone was up here talking about Fortnite and Roblox. Mm -hmm. That's where my son spends all his time. And NFTs are going to be the way that he outfits his avatar in the metaverse. Web3 is going to be us operating in this world, and we're going to need blockchain technology and NFTs to attribute value to our avatars and our identities in this world. So um, I think that's what's exciting about NFTs in particular. Yeah, I don't think it's, and while the NFT market is currently tied to a particular cryptocurrency, I mean, I think that the technology could be anything. I mean, you could buy, you know, buy it with U.S. dollars, and, and as long as it's recorded somewhere on a blockchain, that that's, you know, your unique ownership, um, that will be huge. And I think, and yeah, you, 
I have kids too, and with Roblox, um, Minecraft, World of Warcraft, I mean, all of these games where it's so unlike, you know, Pac-Man when I was growing up in the early 80s. Um, you know, it was, it was you know, you, you bought your game and it was like $29 at, at Zares or Kmart and you went and plugged it in and, and that was it. But now these kids get on these platforms and they're there for years. Uh, and so there really is value to like outfitting your avatar with something. Um, I, could, I can really see the value. Um, you know, very scarce case law. I mean, I think it's still, it's so new, like Lou mentioned, that it's still being litigated at the trial court level. So with respect to precedent being created, there is not any, but it all operates in the existing legal framework. You have trademark, you have copyright, you have all these existing legal frameworks, and that's the way that I operate in this world. You know, it's all new and fancy and shiny and, oh, what are we going to do? There's no regulation. But in reality, there is. I still do the same thing. If it's a smart contract, it, I'll treat it the same as a written contract and sue for it being breached, you know? So that's one of the misconceptions, I think, like, oh, it's new. What's going on? We still do the same work. Um, for the most part. You need a technical understanding, but the same principles still apply and you still can operate and get the same protections. And I haven't seen anything unique come out, at least to get to your question in the um, in judicial determinations. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the digital wallet is just a bucket on a wall. Um, is, is kind of where it goes back to. We, we have the laws, we'll just fit them up under, under there. But you're right though, we need case law to develop, you know, to, to have a little bit more certainty about where these buckets, buckets, where, where these items are categorized. Got time for one more question? Yeah. yeah. I just want to say something, I have another question. Sure. Yeah. The day you can find how to regulate a Ponzi scheme, then you can do it. But as long as it's a Ponzi scheme, you won't be able to do it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? One more. I think this gentleman over here was the first, actually. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tarua. We have co-founder of Tuesday. We have non-profits. Um, this is Tuesday. We facilitate uh, crypto donations. Any new development on the uh, liability of, uh, of, of and the benefits of tax, tax benefits and the liability I don't know the answer to that. We're all yeah. looking at the account, and that's that's a good question. Not not as far as I know so far. Uh, I'm sure that's coming down the line pretty quick. Uh, but but as of right now, I haven't heard any of that. I mean, the, I think yeah. the rule of thumb is disclose it. Yeah. And let them sort it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even the even the, the major exchanges are, are already going to be in compliance with 1099 uh, laws, and so once once that's in full effect, then I would assume charitable nations would be shortly to follow. But it should it should have the same classification as correct. If I gave my correct. car yep. money, would it be treated as a car or as money? Uh, most likely as, as a cash donation. It'll okay. Be a cash donation. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. All right, I think we'll be around if anyone wants to. Thank you.